Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining MDRC's public training for today. Today's discussion is provided by the lead-in program. Um, today, we'll be having a discussion about, let's talk about inclusion, hiring deaf and hard of hearing employees. Um, get comfortable, we will be starting If Felice, can you hit record as well? Yep, I'm going to start exactly as well. Okay. We are now live on Facebook and audio is working. Okay, welcome to everyone on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this program today is a public training brought to you by MDRC Bleed In Program. Uh, the conversation today is let's talk about inclusion, hiring deaf, and hard of hearing employees. And it is just about, no, it is exactly 12 o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started. This presentation will be recorded today. So I'm going to go ahead. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Again, good afternoon. Today's discussion is brought to you by MDRC's lead-in program. Uh, today's conversation is let's talk about inclusion, hiring deaf and hard of hearing employees. Today's discussion will be hosted by Tamika Fishing Spruce, the lead-in program director. And our guest speaker for today is Teddy Dorset III. Uh, he is um, from Black Death, Black Death Advocates of the Detroit Channel. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We welcome questions. Please feel free to ask any questions during our presentation. We will also have time at the end for questions. Feel free to unmute <coughs> yourself, raise your hand, or type in the chat. Thank you, Mary. Good morning. Hey, we have an ASL interpreter today. Uh, live captioning is also being typed. This presentation, as I said earlier, is being recorded and is streaming live on Facebook. We will also upload our presentations to our YouTube channel. Presentations, uh, presenters, excuse me, will be doing visual descriptions of images. If we miss one, please let us know. Uh, and again, we'll send slides and the link to the recording for all who are registered today. Um, this presentation is brought to you by MDRC. MDRC cultivates disability pride and strengthens the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. Um, in the uh, photo next to MDRC mission is the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition sign. Um, it is an orangish uh, kind of ombre um, purple color. MDRC leadership programs or leadership programs are funded by the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council. Uh, and below uh, that is the MIDDC, the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council logo. It uh, has Michigan, MI in green, with DD in blue, a darker blue next to a lighter blue with the symbol of Michigan um, in the middle of one of the Ds, as well as a blue C. Okay, lead in inclusive network, a program that creates a community of practice supporting organizations that primarily serve BIPOC communities to reach their inclusion goals for people with disabilities. Um, and the photo is uh, our lead and uh, director, Tamika Essigen Spruce. She is uh, sitting with our first cohort members. Okay, the lead and team. So again, that is Tamika Essigen Spruce. She is our program director. I am Felice Turner. I am, I will be moderating today. And I am also uh, the program's disability specialist. 
Priscilla Cano is our program bilingual, at bilingual advocate, as well as Agent A. Thomas, our leadership program director. Uh, and the photo above, uh, to me, this photo, she is in a white background, kind of a close up uh, face shot with a blue jean jacket and white shirt. My photo, Felice Turner, I am sitting on a blue couch. I have on red earrings, excuse me, red glasses, um, with a wet black winter hat. Silicana is um, wearing glasses and a black background with more of a tweed black and white jacket. And Asian A. Thomas is, has a brick background. Um, she has braids with glasses and has on a black shirt. Three of the women, Tamika, myself, and Asian A, are all black or African American women. Silicana is a uh, lot. Um, and I will go ahead and switch on over to Tamika so she can further tell you more about herself and introduce the best speaker. Yes, hello, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today uh, for our discussion, Breaking Barriers. Uh, and so, um, you know, this discussion is really important uh because uh we know that uh the deaf and hard of hearing uh community um, individuals have uh, challenges as all you know many uh disabled people do uh when it comes to uh the workforce uh this month is the national uh disability appointment um a month so you know really excited to have this uh discussion um so i'm just going to share a few facts of why this, this discussion is um important uh approximately uh, 53 percent of deaf and hard of hearing adults in the united states participate in the workforce uh, compared to around 75 percent of the hearing population and so um, also when it comes to, you know, unemployment rates, uh, again, that, uh, you know, people who are deaf and hard of hearing have uh, lower employment rates, uh, unemployment rates or underemployment compared to uh, the hearing population. And also when it comes to earnings, uh, that uh, people who are deaf and hard of hearing individuals earn significantly uh, less on average than hearing um, counterparts. Uh, data shows that uh, the earnings is about 25% less than annual uh, annually than hearing um, employees. And, and this is, you know, consistent among um, industries and um, experiences. And so, um, I am, you know, ecstatic and happy uh, to hear to have here with me today uh, my friend, my brother, uh, Teddy Dorsett uh, the third, uh, the president of National uh, Black Deaf Advocates Detroit chapter. Um, he also is an entrepreneur and a uh, filmmaker, and so um, you know he's going to be here today talking about you know, um, his personal experience, but then also um, answering questions of how can we start addressing uh, the needs of uh, deaf and hard of hearing uh, employees in the workforce. So I'm ecstatic here. So welcome, Teddy. Thank you for uh, joining me today. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. You, yeah, it's, it's good to see you again. And I, I really appreciate you in, uh, extending the invite to me to speak today. I'll just talk about my background and myself. Um, I, uh, I'll just go ahead and identify myself visually. I'm a black man uh, with dreadlocks uh, extending about to my shoulders. I have a black polo on, a black shirt, and with an orange collar. And I'm sitting uh, just on a black chair. And I have kind of an off-white color background behind me. 
Okay, my name is Teddy. My sign name is like this. Uh, so today I'm just going to be talking about the topic, this very important topic. And uh, yeah, I'm just ready to get started. Yes, yes. So if you could tell us um, a little bit about your employment journey and a little bit about entrepreneurship as well. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that question. So really where I come from is a long line of family members who own businesses. My On my father's side, uh, my father's mother, actually, my grandmother, she owned a restaurant in Detroit and Hyde Park. Uh, she owned a restaurant there and it was very, very successful. I remember many days going to the restaurant with her and the restaurant and have soul food. My dad's actually owned um, a business as well. He uh, had a hair stylist salon and he was he owned the hair hair salon, the hair shop a long time ago. Um, he owned five different locations in Detroit. And he has many, many years of experience. So I saw my dad managing the business and many different people and employers for that time. And that's where I kind of was also figured out that to get my college experience and my work experience was was through my dad and my grandma's restaurant as well. And that's where I started um, my entrepreneurial journey. My dad was really, really big on self-independence and self-reliance. Uh, he knows, you know, the old story of pulling yourself up from your our own bootstraps, you know, and that was really what I grew up being taught and being preached to. And that's when I started to feel like I, I wanted to create opportunities to create, uh, to have some ownership because he already recognized that in me and already had a lot of barriers uh, that I faced because I'm black, um, I'm a man, and I'm deaf. So with those being my barriers, my father recognized that, and he always really encouraged me to take ownership and work and learn hard to create uh, skills, tools, and be able to work and earn my own money not and not have to depend on the system for support because my father recognized that there are systemic barriers that there are, it's not equal for other people in society and it's not inclusive there's a lot of uh, oppression about with disabilities and other types of barriers so my father taught me really to be self-reliant and to uh, be able to take care of myself and earn my own work experience. I did learn some tools. For example, I learned how to cut hair. I became a cosmetologist and I actually am a licensed cosmetologist as well, but um, I haven't really been doing that in a few years. My dad taught me that how to do that work. And that was work that I, I did while I was in college, in my college days. So I could do haircuts on the side for my friends uh, my in the women's dorms and things like that. And I also really approached many, many barriers looking for work or face many barriers in trying to look for employment because a lot of programs and, and uh, corporations discriminated against me because they there were communication barriers. I couldn't necessarily communicate with customers. So I had to look for employment at a hair salon. And one day, actually, I did meet one of uh, a hair stylist, a black man, and he approached me and said, you know, why don't you why don't you come work with me? And he recognized that 
there weren't a lot of opportunities. So I worked with him and he gave me that opportunity to, to work there and work with my own customers and clients and grow in, in my own career as a hairstylist. And I'm really thankful for him for giving me that opportunity many years ago. Um, and he mentored me and gave me that opportunity so that I could actually get into the field of cosmetology and, and be able to start that business. Like I said, my dad already owned his hair stylist and cosmetology business, but uh, he actually had already closed down his businesses by that time. And I went into, by the time that I went into college, and that helped me really to get in there garnish the opportunities to work in that field and develop the skills to earn my own money and create that opportunity for myself out of the freelance work for myself and my self-employment. So really my job was working many different restaurants and things like that, washing dishes, cleaning tables, um, also facing many barriers and because of trying to cre uh, create other opportunities for me to advance in my career. Uh, there were a lot of people at that time who looked down on me and said that how, you know, said, how could I be able to understand and communicate with customers? How would I understand their needs? I tried to instill in them that I could do that, but a lot of people just decided not to let me in that opportunity. So I, I had to leave that industry. And that's just one example of a barrier that I faced. So when I transitioned industries and looked for other types of employment, I still faced many, many other barriers in that. And I decided to go back to freelance work at that time. So freelance work that I did was uh, during my time in college. Uh, I knew as uh, one person who wanted to become a doctor and he realized, you know, I was deaf at that time. And. I, th I thought that it would be impossible for me to become a doctor. I said that really I couldn't, it would be impossible. And I didn't see any really individuals in the field who were doctors who were deaf at that time. There were no role models for me to look up to. And I, I felt really discouraged by that and decided to pursue other career opportunities. Uh, one thing is that I was really passionate about other career fields, including filmmaking and films. So I was really fascinated and interesting in films and I wanted to, I liked the visuals. I, I saw lots of different stories and people with a lot of experience. I was fascinated by filmmaking and, but again, there weren't a lot of role models that I, people like me who were deaf uh, in the film industry. There were a few here and there, yes, but not many, especially who were black. There were just a few uh, who looked like me. And like I said, my dad at that time was uh, kind of starting to work into the film industry back at that time in the early 2000s. Um, there was an industry in Michigan. It was really taking off. There was a lot of uh, mill movie development and filmmaking in the area. And I took that opportunity to work with my dad and get involved in filmmaking. And from there, I was able to pick up the, the tools and the experience to know and learn how to record in the film industry and I started to really refine my own skills so I could be a storyteller and a filmmaker and start to gain my own experience and tell my own community of what it's like being black and disabled in the in the community. So I was able to really take up the skills uh, while I was in college through that and that I actually decided to major in filmmaking and and continued with uh, freelance work at, at that time. Um, I did really struggle to find opportunities in filmmaking in the industry, just the same idea because of those barriers that I faced. And really one opportunity that I had was working with um, one organization in Detroit, um, the Deaf Organization, Deaf Professionals Art, uh, network. And I was actually working with them freelance. That's where I was able to pick up more of my own skills and refine my skills and content creation related to the deaf experience. And from there, I was had the opportunity to transition to full-time employment, working with uh, the National Association of the Deaf. 
I worked with them for in Detroit, the Disability Power, and uh, at Gall Gallaudet University. So those were really the three opportunities that I had for salaried employment. There were two, two that were actually deaf organizations of those three. And I was working with, uh, with them, trying to get uh, opportunities to work in um, that environment and really connect with um, my community and be able to uh, communicate with other people in the organization because everybody signed and understood each other. So that was really nice to be able to communicate with each other. The other one uh, that I worked for was the Detroit Disability Power. And that's where I had opportunities to really grow in my career because at, back at that time, really, I, they provided a lot of uh, mentorship for my work and communication managers. Okay. Okay, you want me to go ahead? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay, no problem. Sorry, we're switching interpreters. Um, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, so um, the, the disability power there, um, it was an interpreter they brought in and helped me a lot to be able to communicate and for the with the individuals and uh, during meetings and they provided me with uh, uh, just different you know things that they could ass assess me with you know and it went straight forward from there and uh, the Detroit Power uh, organization uh, really thought about the deaf people and they went with the inclusion and all so it was very. Uh, heartwarming. It was really nice to be able to uh, be able to be included as a disabled person, and uh, the opportunity was there. So right now, I'm back to uh, working uh, with myself as an ownership, as my own business, or uh, as an entrepreneur. And uh, in Flint, I think it is uh, that um, first it was in. I'm sorry, Teddy, Teddy Boy. Teddy Boy Films, yes, and uh, and entertainment. And my father and I, uh, they they are they're uh, uh, two o five. I guess it's two o five before and twenty. I'm sorry, twenty o five. They uh, two thousand five. Yes. Then we um we had the film um at that time, and so. Uh, the company was established and we, but now he's been gone now uh, since 2013. My father's passed away in 2013. And then he uh, gave me, I basically took on the business and been going from there. And so we're making different films and different like videos and such. And uh, so it's, you know, it's been a challenge, but it was carrying on. And I noticed that uh, since then, and since 2021 even, uh, the um, uh, the social social media, yeah, been really going crazy. And at that time, we didn't have very much access to the social media at the time. But um, I'm sorry, it was very it wasn't very accessible. Or was I'm sorry, and um, so then the other um, deaf and disabled people could imagine also they were having disability uh, barriers too. And then they decided to set up their own companies also called Deaf Lens. Deaf Lens uh, and Media and LTD. And it was... Uh, a marketing agency to provide uh, access, you know, for uh, for people who had a hard time getting into the industry, I guess. And it was access to uh, with the emailing and different things. And the company was set up. It was for the deaf and blind, and they worked with them. And uh, many people were provided with, uh, 
you know, the, the, the deaf and disability were provided with a, a, a opportunities to work with many uh, places where, you know, where they had barriers. And, but they were, uh, but it, I've been very happy with what's been going. It's been interesting work as I travel through. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank, thank you for, for sharing uh, feedback. Oh, good. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing, you know, your journey um, as a person with a disability, too, with a physical disability. I know, uh, you know, there are, you know, very many challenges. So sometimes, you know, entrepreneurship is a great, you know, way to kind of just you know, create your own opportunities, uh, you know, in the industry and, you know, showing people what you can, can do. So thank you, you know, for that. And that's where, you know, I met you at Detroit Disability Power um, about what, it was, what, five years ago? How long has it been? 2019, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, um, so my question for you, um, and, and for those who are with us, um, feel free to put you know your own um, comments and answers to the chat um, in the chat towards um, for this question is uh, what are some of the top barriers you know that are deaf and hard of hearing employees. Um, experience in the workforce. What would, what would you say about that? And again, feel free, the audience, to put your answers in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, I think. Um, thank you, Tamir. Uh, Tamika. Um, I feel like the top three um, would be. Uh, possible to really define the top three, but I best I think the best I can uh, let you know would be number one is communication barrier, and uh, you know no interpreters or you know very few interpreters, not many out there. Uh, so it's it's kind of hard for the individual, the deaf individual, to get an interpreter because that's a barrier for the communication, and it's hard. That's not. It's not, a, you know, we need that accessibility. We need, for interviews, you need to bring in an interpreter for any kind of communication. You know, we we have to have that interpreter come in. And um, I'm trying to think what else uh, you could say. Oh, let me think. Um, I, I guess high uh, uh, accommodations, you know, to be able to accommodate with uh, many people, you know, trying to bring in the interpreter, like I said, once again, for just any kind of accessibility that needs that we might need, you know, just many different uh, excuses that, that people give and provide why they don't want to, you know, students that was say there's a barrier because there's no interpreter or whatever. There's a lot of different excuses that people don't bring an interpreter and just uh, advancement, professional advancement, another a third one kind of thing, you know, the deaf people. Hard hearing people, blind people that I'm working with, you know, that's the that's the thing. They face those barriers of not being able to be promoted or what whatnot. And so, uh, you know, the accessibility to not be uh, have that, you know, barrier of communication and that's no support <clears throat> in that spot. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of thing that's we're limited. We're limited in just the basics or something, you know, and that's a challenge for us to get the opportunities to be able to get out there and advance and such. And so it's because of the accessibility of no communication. Yeah, yeah, those those are, you know, I can totally understand, you know, those be some of, you know, the, the barriers that exist. I know accommodations is, you know, a big one with, you know, disabilities across uh, the board as well. So uh, my next question is, how can employers and recruiters or particularly, you know, um, employers can ensure that their hiring, hiring processes 
uh, is accessible and inclusive to deaf and hard of hearing candidates. Well, um, uh, oh, pro being proactive um, for like this situation. When the situation pops up, you ask for the accommodation and then go ahead and just uh, the area that you might have a meeting in or such thing, just different, you know, being just to ask for that accommodation and then that person already identifies themselves as being disabled, go ahead and do that. And then ask, you know, what and if a person would ask what kind of accommodations do you need? If the company would educate at, and provide accessibility to, uh, you know, the workers and such, you know, and just some, get some feedback and, you know, being proactive and just, you know, get, making it known that, hey, listen, you know, there's monies that's needed, there's special ideas that we may need, or, you know, the federal money or something like that, that we can provide, that can be provided for these accommodations and such, just to work it out like that. Okay, so you would uh, recommend, uh, like, so a deaf for, a deaf candidate to, you know, ask the, um, let's say they get called in for an interview. And so they say, well, I need, you know, ASL interpreter, uh, can you provide it? So you would recommend a candidate asking for those accommodations. And so, uh, but what about with the employer? Uh, what can they do? Uh, so, you know, cause I know in our work in leading, we tell, you know, employers to have a vendor's list. So, you know, have a list of interpreters that they can, you know, be able to provide, you know, um, during, you know, the hiring practice, hiring pra uh, process or, you know, whatever the case may be. So would you, you know, recommend doing something like that or uh, also maybe like a, a hiring disability statement or like what could, the tangible fees that you you recommend employers do uh, to for their uh, deaf and hard of hearing candidates. I can go. So whenever uh, before or after the hiring process, just wondering because there oh, there cool. are kind of different things that happen in that process before. Yeah. Okay, so I would say one thing is just to mention that to make sure that they do have a list of, of vendors and interpreter agencies already ready, maybe that they've worked with in the past, or that they could work with uh, maybe the different recommendations of in, uh, interpreter agencies in the area. That's good to have that prepared in advance, just so that if somebody does come for an interview, that they can be prepared to have an interpreter. Um, oftentimes interpreters are over Zoom and that creates other barriers too because there aren't necessarily a lot of uh, accessible tools or resources, technology online um, for people to access in person. So that can also take time to schedule to get an interpreter for as well. If it's a remote an interview, it does take a little bit longer to process to get an interpreter, but it can be easier to get an interview scheduled online, but you do have to consider how long it takes to get an interpreter scheduled for that. Um, one thing that you can think about is just being prepared in advance and have that ready for a deaf candidate or hard of hearing person, um, because you can ask a candidate what types of accommodations they need and have the tools and resources available. So that if just, for example, a company had an educational training um, on, maybe best practices for the hiring deaf and hard of hearing people. There are organizations out there who provide resources and trainings like National Association of the Deaf, for example, and many different other organizations. Disability Power provides um, disability awareness trainings. 
in different uh, types of classes and trainings. So really uh, the business needs to be proactive about going to these types of trainings and having them for their staff thinking ahead so that they can consider if they have a um, deaf, hard of hearing or deaf blind person that they can reduce some of the barriers that, that maybe they would face. And some in my own process, uh, and the barriers that I've faced, you know, were, included some of the trainings really were beneficial too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And so uh, for, Yes. Before you uh, move on, I just want to uh, point out some uh, some of the conversation in the chat. Um, Terry Gordinia, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. She cites language deprivation as a barrier. Also, Chelsea Munger says, hi, Teddy, Chelsea here. Thank you for doing this today. I really appreciate it. I'm proud of you for your journey and still and still going strong today. It's amazing how much we have overcome and still fighting. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you uh, for reading that, uh, Felice, and those who uh, commented. So continue, you know, uh, to comment in the chat and uh, ask any question. So, you know, we talked about uh, a little bit about the hiring process and as far as with, uh, you know, accommodations. Um, so my uh, other question is, you know, what are the best practices companies can implement to support deaf and hard of hearing employees in their day to day work beyond initial accommodation? So, uh, from their day to day. Yeah, well, for best practices, you know, I'll share. I'll share one really important thing it's nice to have good strong uh solid work cl closure and, and uh culture excuse me um so that you can believe in diversity inclusion accessibility and a list of other traits that you have in the workplace and that's practice by providing workshops by providing training um, by being, including all staff, including dis people with disabilities who are deaf and hard of hearing. And that's the most important part because that helps to, to make sure that everyone in the workforce feels welcome and included and that they feel like the company provides opportunities and per actually listens to the, the employee employees, including who are deaf and hard of hearing, that they are thoughtful and responsive to people's uh, needs and requests. And I think that's really where you can start, that that's a really great place to actually start and to think about how you can benefit your employees by providing trainings and workshops so you can increase the work culture and include people who are deaf, hard of hearing and blind and with other disabilities. In my experience, if that company doesn't have that, I think that I don't normally want to continue working there because I think that work culture is really important. And if my boss doesn't have that, if they don't provide any types of trainings, if they don't provide resources, or if they don't provide interpreter accessibility or anything else like that, I don't know that I would be able to continue working there because of those types of barriers. And a lot of times, people who are deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind would feel str strongly impacted by those types of barriers. So I would say that they should try try to implement that those things. Um, you know, they can ask their employees who are deaf and hard of hearing what types of accommodations that they need and try to provide that. But there still might be different disability barriers and uh, discrimination. But I know that it's not going to be perfect 100%, but people should try to make sure to reduce those barriers as much as possible. Yes, yes, yes. In the chat, I'm sorry, Chelsea says, I really, I really strongly believe that every company needs to have an interpreter on site. If they have one or more deaf employees, even having VRI or something immediate. Mandatory training for every company to gain their understanding of having a deaf employee. We don't fight. Um, Tony Cannon said, did a lot of work with Teddy in the community. I'm glad he's presenting here. I would agree employers need to add an interpreter at training meetings, orientations, and someone to talk about 
excuse me, as someone to talk with during the daily task of the job. Thank you everyone for coming. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and that really, yes. Did you want to add anything to the response to the questions or comments, Teddy? Did you want to respond? I don't want to cut you off. Yes. Um Definitely, I, I very, very much that. Yes, uh, definitely agree with that, um, with your comment for sure, um, because it's not only necessarily thinking about adults, but you do have to think about youth as well um, with DEI and our black, deaf and hard of hearing uh, blind youth. There are in our community and there are future generations and we need to work together in our various different organizations to make sure that we are providing opportunities um, to teach our youth and educate them, not just focusing on employers and businesses and organizations of that source, um, but for how to hire deaf and hard of hearing people. But we also need to start teaching and encouraging our deaf, hard of hearing and deafblind youth as well and adults who are still, you know, either learning and, and, you know, going through their journey and challenges of different barriers that they face, finding and keeping employment. So we do need to work with, with them and, and DEI throughout the, through the years so that we can make sure to continue to cherish and support our deaf, hard of hearing youth as well. Yes, yes. And I see uh, Terry had uh, a, a really great example, another one of accommodation and work of the police of you. Want to read that comment? Yep. So Terry says flashing lights for firearms would be one example of an accommodation to the work environment. That, that definitely sounds good. Um, some other Comments are um, some employers want someone with experience and who thinks deaf and hard of hearing can't do the job. Um, also, Nancy says, um, do you, is, is it that do you investigate to the company on how many deaf and deaf blind are trying to get that job? Okay. Uh, so that was a yeah, question. So what would your answer be? I'm Teddy to that question. Yeah, so what what is the question exactly? I, I think that's a great question. Um yeah, I I do see that often personally. I I don't necessarily see um a lot of awareness. A lot of companies, organizations just businesses just kind of follow the their trends in, in their in their industries and that really is exactly the type of of information that we do need um, to share with them not just the business organizations but also with our our federal government as well and legislature so we need to make laws about um the impacts on the deaf and hard of hearing community and finding jobs. There's not necessarily a lot of data and it is important to be aware of that. I wish that we did know the statistics about, about that, um, but there are, there are training programs and companies who are trying to interview and hire deaf individuals. But in general, we the statistics on how many people are actually hired into jobs is not really working. Um, we don't have good statistics on that. We don't have specific numbers. And maybe internally, companies might keep some data, but likely only larger companies like Google, Amazon, uh, and Facebook, those big types of companies who hire a lot of employees might keep statistics on how many disabled individuals they hire. But that types of numbers nationally or, or even in smaller organizations isn't really well kept. 
Um, I do believe that that is a really great question and something to consider in the research. Um, potentially, maybe organizations, businesses could keep that in mind for their future endeavors and hiring processes to see and get a feel for how how they could use that data to see how um, to improve their hiring practices and uh, employment policies so that they can provide accessible opportunities to, and help their internal purposes. I think that that is a good practice and businesses should be able to do that. Um, Marguerite has her hand up. Put your hand up. Um, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, feel free to um, turn your camera on. And thank you for that question. Marguerite, did you still have a question? No. Okay. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Kitty, for the coming in because. Because me, I am, I am a person that is out of here and with terrible privacy. So, no. the people, people, May not know that I am part of hearing, but but how this this is a question that been bugging me because how how many. How many out of here and just blind are so easy at especially in the city of Detroit because we have very low very low and in hiring of people that are deaf and how to pay and deaf blind that are African American descent or uh, American Indian descent in and, and Latino. So how how are they going to find out about jobs that they know that they are qualified to do and sit here before I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Marguerite. Uh, I can see. I know the concern here. I know it's an important subject here that we're talking about and important questions and I can understand. It's a big influence, it's right, that you're mentioning. Uh, I know the city of Detroit does have uh, resources, they do, and different place, different things that, like there's a Detroit at work, there's a different program set up for people in Detroit that take advantage 
you know, with, and they can do practicing and resources that they can match up people for jobs specifically. And they have uh, office uh, disability, office disability that's called uh, uh, features. Mm -hmm. Office disability features. And they can uh, share. Uh, they, they have other things that accommodate. And um, I, I can hear my feedback on me. I can hear feedback. Sorry. Um, anyway, the support that they are provided out there in the city of, uh, of Detroit, you know, that there's some, there's best practices also there for the deaf and hard of hearing. And uh, we have uh, uh, just uh, different things for the deaf and, and hard of hearing and deaf blind, uh, just different families backgrounds. There's different things like that, that uh, just that there's different things that, that, there's, that, have, that has barriers, but we can break those barriers and the offices services that we have here. So there's different, different places. And uh, I know there's different advocates that, you know, uh, deaf and blind and hard of hearing members here in the city that we can have an organization resources that will help us to uh, advocate for each other and for ourselves and for and work to, as we work together and communicate and use our voice and and our, our signs and just whatever we can you know do to be incorporated in and in, in be inclusive Floyd and uh uh, just to continue on with, you know, different organizations and we just have to keep, you know, uh, educating and, and just being able to be inclusive and just advocate for ourselves. I know that's what I've had to do my, my own business. I know I've had to do that same kind of thing. I have to say, hey, you know, I, this is a deaf organization. You know, we can work together. You know, what do you think? You know, it's a city. We, we need to improve our city here. And so let's uh, take this opportunity to get together and discuss things and, and approach things in there maybe a different way to improve ourselves here. And, and that's, that's what I wanna do is to be able to set this organization up, to be able to uh, just keep, move ahead and, and, and work things out for the community. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for uh, the question, Marguerite and uh, Nancy. Those are really great questions. And so, uh, for you, Teddy, um, I know you talked um, about workplace culture and creating, um, you know, a better workplace culture for those with disabilities, you know, deaf and hard of hearing. I know their uh, reports have indicated that deaf and hard of hearing individuals experience higher rates of, of workplace discrimination, without either that be barriers and inaccessible hiring practices, you know, which we talked about, uh, but also lack of awareness of deaf culture and misconceptions about their capabilities. And so, um, you know, my question to you, in your experience, how does deaf culture, which isn't really uh, talked about, I think, enough, uh, how can deaf culture contribute to more diverse and innovative workplace? Yes, uh, right. <laughs> Oftentimes it's not discussed or things aren't shared enough and things just happen in the workplace. You know, one reason that, uh, you know, they hire or they uh, hire deaf or hard of hearing, you know, they go there is just, if they have a deaf or hard of hearing or a blind person that's there, then they have to learn their deaf culture and uh, share it with their experiences and they need to accommodate that way. And the organization needs to work with the deaf and hard of hearing person. And, you know, to, to continue to make it best practices. So, uh, you know, um, the deaf and hard of hearing, deaf blind, you know, have these barriers of course, but um, 
you know, we we be able to to communicate and to to work together. You know, you have to have that uh, communication, and you have to break down those barriers and learn their culture. And we have video relay, the video phones, uh, that they can use that. The deaf, I know, you know, they go, come on, you know. There's other resources too, you know. There's uh, the meetings that you know you have captioned meetings or whatever, you, or um, I guess it's on Zoom, yeah, on Zoom, and you can have be there physically. You notice that you have many workers that feel like, oh, uh, uh, interpreter, I like interpreter in person for that meeting, or they have other options you could, you know, because they miss things, maybe some miss questions or stuff like that, if it's on Zoom maybe, or, you know, but if you have the person in there, you know, sometimes they there's a miss, you know, when you're on, on the Zoom. Yeah, you miss things sometimes. So you have to know, that there's, uh, there's going to be questions, of course, and you know the exact thing that's going on in that meeting and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, but it's good to have an interpreter no matter what. Yes. And so if you could explain to the audience, for those who don't know, uh, that should have been probably my question before, but I just asked, but uh, what can you explain? What is deaf culture for those who don't? No, uh, you know, what does that look like? Uh, well, deaf, deaf know, <laughs> so deaf know what to, to do. I mean, deaf culture, I guess it's uh, pretty much uh, what we call the small D, the small D, big D, the capital D, the big D is like, um, a person that's a consumer, a deaf consumer, a person who is deaf, you know, they have experience using the language, ASL language. There's, um, uh, you know, many years and generation of family members who are deaf and such. That's, I'm a true big D deaf person. I'm true, uh, you know, also like, Meaning, like, if I am strong uh, identity with our language and the cult cultural of of who I identify as a big D deaf person, who I'm truly deaf, and I know the language and I'm involved with all that and back and forth, you know, and you know, it's not like this a person who loses their hearing, you know, uh, and they don't know the language, you know, they're it's not they're not exactly in the culture it's involvement of the being involved with the deaf people and inclusive be inclusive with who you are and and the value of our language that's what's very important you, you know it's it's that person who can communicate with each other and and it's a beautiful language asl so yes 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 yeah, thank you for you know explaining that how to to, to all of us, because I think uh, some people, you know, especially um, like people who are hearing or those, uh, you know, companies, they see, uh, you know, ASL as only like an accommodation, you know, but ASL is a language. So, you know, just as if you are, uh, have, you know, maybe employee or, you know, you have someone or like a customer that, you know, speaks Spanish, you know, of course, Spanish is a language, you know, so you have someone who uh, can, you know, interpret in Spanish, so, uh, or any other language for that matter. So, um, you know, ASL, you know, I know there's different kinds and, you know, depend on the country and, and things like that. So, you know, uh, if not anything, people, you know, especially those who are employers, I take away from this conversation that, you know, this ASL is, is a language, it's part of a culture, and, uh, you know, and it should be uh, treated, you know, as such, um, as seen as that. So, um, I know, and speaking of ASL, I know we have some comments up in the chat uh, regarding that. So, uh, Felice, if you can 
read some of the comments in the chat. Yeah, okay, so the chat has been pretty active. Um, give me a second to kind of go up. So earlier, uh, Chelsea said, for instance, I know a deaf person who works at Tyson. It's a big company in Indiana. He fought for so long to get his rights accommodated, but Tyson still failed to follow through. It's really sad. I agree with you. The law uh, makers and et cetera, they need to do better. I'm going for a social worker for these reasons to better our community. That is, uh, that's great. Uh, that's a great way to continue the fight. Um, Tony says, and we have laws that su that's supposed to make sure employers are providing accessibility and accommodations, but they are vague as to how this is supposed to look. Sometimes the need isn't met appropriately. Ajene earlier said interpreters don't always have to be on site. There's speech to text assistive technology and providing access to an interpreter via live video. So that is one additional way um, for interpretation. And Tony then said speech to text is good for one way conversations, not for dialogue. And ASL is definitely language context. Um, then English is an accommodation but may not be the best one. Um, and then Nancy says, just curious, there's a question. Is it required for the uh is it required for deaf to have hearing uh and good glasses to uh, um hearing aid, excuse me, hearing aid and good glasses to get a job? Um uh they say they heard that from a person in the community. He said, uh, they said they feel it's not necessary, not necessarily necessary. Um, and then, oh, go ahead, Teddy, if you want to respond to that yeah. question. Sure. Okay. So if you want me to. Thank you. Thank you for the comments in the chat um, to provide resources and uh, and for, uh, I guess the, for all of the, uh, what they would say in the individual, each person's individual right mm -hmm. to accommodations is really best to accommodate for each person. Each person's like you said, and, so what they prefer, if they prefer ASL, if they prefer uh, captioning or, you know, or, uh, you know, reading, you know, texting back and forth, you know, it's called pro free. I think Everyone has their own preferences of what types of accommodations and tools they actually need. So it's better just to ask the individual who um what types of accommodations and tools that they need it's important to ask them because you can't just assume what the accommodations you need an accommodation for a deaf person might be sign language but there are some deaf people who maybe don't actually use sign but can uh, be able to um, speak themselves and lip read so really every person has their own preferences and <clears throat> accommodations so don't, it's better not to assume it's better to ask the person and then provide the accommodations that they request because it's then you can reduce some of those barriers. And that's really important. Based on my experience, um, I have a little bit of, um, I'll just share briefly about my experience. Let me, I think somebody in the chat had a comment. Let me just read that. Earlier, Agent A said speech to text AT can even be a free app on a phone or more advanced captioning. Um, call captioning call phones that pop new iPhone updates getting better at hearing um accessibility as well. Um, Marguerite says ASL app. Um, and she also says lip reading. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, when you're talking about um, those types of things, they're not always 100% effective. You do still have to rely on the AI and like data online is not necessarily great because like with VRI, sometimes you'll lose signal and like you lose the connections. 
a lot of companies do still struggle with getting captionings perfect because I, you know, you can see even here on Zoom, there's there's the live transcript and it's still not 100% accurate. So that's just one example of how those, it's a reminder and to understand and think about how all of our technology is not perfect yet. It's important to make sure that we are considerate of these types of testing and researching different types of technologies that can have a strong reliance on uh, smooth communication is more important because captionings oftentimes misses things, it misunderstands things. And somebody who is deaf and hard of hearing who's relying on that captions would then uh, only be dependent on those types of misunderstandings and mistranslations in their captionings. Um, I saw in the chat, somebody mentioned something about uh, VRI, video remote interpreting. Uh, personally, for myself, I am not a big fan of VRI just because of the technology problems that go on to that. It's not reliable. Um, oftentimes, the internet will frequently drop out, and that happens often where the, the interpreters on screen, they're choppy, they're freezing, and then I don't have the ability to actually receive that communication on video remote interpreting. And so I oftentimes, you know, relay my concerns where for people who use that, but it it is kind of a problem. Um, it's still kind of a test. People oftentimes like to test it. And like I said, it's better just to ask the deaf and hard of hearing person what tools and resources they are comfortable using because they might have preferences about certain types of technologies and they, they might think that certain technologies help them in better ways than others. So I really just encourage people strongly, especially corporations to listen to deaf and hard of hearing candidates or employees to whatever their preferred method of communication is because that's the most important thing. They know themselves best. Excuse me. Tony said lip reading isn't really effective. Lots of information can be missed and it's not always um um and it's not always effective. Um where did it say? Oh my goodness. Um and it's not always taught. It's something that's acquired over time but still not dependable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely, um, you know, uh, agree agree with that. And so, um, you know, thank you, you know, Teddy, for you know answering uh, those questions. And I like, uh, you know, what you said is that it's best to ask the employee themselves. You know, because uh, they know themselves best. Because uh, you know, accommodations have to be catered to each. Um, individual. So um, I really, really like that. Um, and so um, also want to mention, I know it's 106, we're going to continue to 130, but just in case if you have to hop off, uh, there will be an evaluation link um, in the chat. And we would love to hear, you know, your feedback about today's uh, discussion. Um, also, feel free um, on the evaluation to leave, um, you know, future topics that you would like us to um, talk about, you know, in the future um, as well. And so uh, my uh, next question is, uh, you know, just more about the... Uh, you know what's what you know comes to deaf and hardy hard of hearing employees. What strategies do you recommend for um, advocating for their needs and thriving in professional environments? You know, because we talked about so much of you know the barriers that exist. So how can they, you know, become an advocate uh, for themselves and thrive? Yes, um, there are many deaf-led organizations. For example, I'm involved with one local chapter, the Detroit Black um, Deaf, the Detroit Deaf Association, and we do provide services for deaf, uh, deaf-blind, and deaf, hard of hearing individuals who are deaf, and making sure that we provide accessibility to and our voice being represented in our community 
um, to make sure that we are getting equal services, uh, healthcare, and employment. And that's one thing that we do to serve the community. There are other national uh, organizations, for example, the National Association of the Deaf, the National Deaf Center on Post-Secondary Outcomes. Um, that's NDCP. And they provide a lot of resources, um, materials, webinars, uh, trainings, and, and many different other things specifically related to employment and opportunities for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. Um, and they do have really great resources there. So there are, like I said, many different organizations that you can uh, learn about who do advocacy in these fields. Okay. And um, and so uh, what would you say, I know those are great organizations to support uh, people, but like also what would be your advice, you know, if they, uh, if the employer, uh, like the example um, above, I think it was, I forgot what organization business, but let's say, you know, Ford, for example, uh, you know, what are they not providing accommodations or they give it trouble or whatever the case may be what would be your advice to the deaf and hard of hearing employee you know dealing with an employer like that you know what would be your advice to them yeah, I, I do have some experience in that, um, in that type of situation. Really, any, many people who, who say that, um, who go through just regular channels of uh, command, meaning like any types of concerns that people have with their bosses, or you know their boss's boss or up their boss's boss's boss with hr and you have to just go through those channels um as best as you can uh, if not you can sometimes get uh, notes or any types of documentation or anything else i just recommend that people keep those documents of communication that way if there ever is a situation or types of issues of, of real concern you have that evidence um there are federal and local agencies in the area who are able to support individuals who face discrimination and barriers in the workplace. Um, uh, for example, in Detroit, Michigan, um, we do have one or office of disability uh, office and the uh, disability rights CMISH Department of Civil Rights, Civil Rights. Um, and they they do that's a state level agency you can file a complaint or a grievance with them and really the best practice is just to just to go through the appropriate channels and as best as you can within your organization and if nothing works out then i think that it's important to file a grievance with the state and that way but i do recommend that you keep evidence and any documentation to help the agency actually see that Docu clearly documented list of grievances and and errors of discrimination. That way they can actually take note of that um, and hopefully affect some change because without documentation or without any types of evidence, a complaint might not really go anywhere. They would think, well, there's not really any documented evidence and there's nothing we can do. We don't see any issues that are documented. So that's my that number one thing is that they really oftentimes need a lot of documentation. And if they don't see any complaints coming in from companies, then they can't do anything either. I encourage people in the community being deaf, deaf blind, deaf, or hard of hearing, anytime that you face any types of discrimination to document it and do have the resources and support available to help you fill out and document anything if, if you're struggling, if you don't understand certain forums, if you don't understand certain things, there are organizations who will provide interpreters or provide access for you to actually understand those forms um, and document it appropriately. So that would be my advice to anybody going through that. I do understand that the process can be very, very burdensome and very sensitive. Um, it's not easy. So really, uh, there are agencies and systems who are able to support you in that. Um, 
You can also, of course, rely on friends and family who are uh, familiar with your experience to rely on them to help you through the, through the process. But the biggest thing that I can say is to document it and take your time because disability rights organizations um, really does, they know that it takes time and a lot of effort to go through the process of kind of working through that trauma and opening up yourself um, to go through this process. And, you know, it, really all you have is yourself. No one's going to advocate for you. And so you can't really just put it off and think nothing of it. But our organizations with the, the Detroit um, Deaf Association, there's many deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind people in the community who understand your struggles and, and because we go through the same things ourselves. So we're here to support you. Yes, thank you. And I'll make sure, um, you know, after this presentation that I will, uh, we will provide the links uh, with the recording. So uh, that Teddy mentioned uh, today. Uh, I see there's two questions, one from uh, Maria and Nancy, uh, please, if you can ask those questions. Okay, so um, I see uh, Marguerite said correct earlier. Um, Nancy said, do you, have, do you have a workshop or a life coach to help deaf and deafblind to learn how to work for a company? Um, and then she's also looking for um, the phone number of the organization so she can give them a call. Um, she has a deaf uh, and deaf voice call. Okay, and oh, we have one more, I'm sorry. Uh, Chelsea uh, said self-advocacy is a big one, but also self-determination is what we need the most as well. One needs to be determined to keep on going and not to give up just because it's too hard. Um, I absolutely love that. As far as resources, we'll do our best to provide you all with resources uh, discussed today when we send out the recorded response. Yeah, and I see Maria asked to, are there any organizations that you recommend that provide trainees to uh, learn ASL for a company? So um, if you can answer that quickly, Teddy, you know, like I said, we'll, you know, provide a link to that as well. Uh, but Teddy, do you know any organizations that provide trainees uh, ASL for companies? Um, yes. Sorry, I was in the middle of typing a response. Um, so really, I wish that I knew of any live co uh, life coaches who, if you know of anyone, please let me know, but I don't. Um, secondly, at times, in terms of organizations out there who are able to provide uh, trainings, uh, webinars, resources on how to, how they can uh, the deaf and hard of hearing community can learn sign language and work working for the company. I just mentioned a few, the NDCP, the National Disability Center, uh, they have resources uh, online and you could look through those. If they don't have what you're looking for, then there are some other resources that, um, that we can share. I think that we're planning to, um, I just plan to type out a response but I could share my email address as well if you'd like to reach out to me. And I can ask a few people if they have some other resources that I could, and I'd be happy to, to help you with that if you just reach out to me. Yes, yes, thank you. And uh, I go back to what Nancy said, because I know that's probably, you know, a, a question that many people will wonder, you know, wondering because you're so, you know, uh, great. So do you provide a uh, workshop or life coaching, you know, to deaf or deaf and blind um, individuals? Do you provide Deb that? In the chat, Deb in the chat says devhhs.org offers online ASL classes. Um, and Chelsea says, uh, she's not mistaken, MDPR also does that as well to go to places and businesses 
uh, to teach them what to do or not to do. Um, Teddy, she's asking for clarification on this as well. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, yeah, as you can see, you know, there are places in the city, yeah, that will provide things. Um, yes, uh, there's many resources, really. Um, let me see here. So do you provide life coaching, you personally, or the Deaf Black Advocate City life coaching personally? Myself, uh, no, not particularly life coaching. Um, you know, I, I, I don't particularly myself do that, but uh, um, I did. I did do some myself. I'm just joking. I do do some myself. Oh, oh sorry. Carter. Lord knows that I need one myself. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we when we're talking, you know, to the deaf and the uh, community, we need that support. We do. And sometimes there's so many barriers and different things that we're trying to get through. We have a lot of personal traumas and stuff like that before that we've worked out in our jobs and stuff. And we're trying to just keep on going, you know, the best we can. And our uh, trauma, you know, that we've had to work through, Lord, you know, through that, we've needed the support too in Detroit. And I know that um, uh, one or two people who are deaf certified you know, coaches or certified uh, counselors like coaches, they, many, you know, they've shared many resources too on that as aspect too, they've, they've shared. Just okay. for clarification, I know, I know one or two certified deaf life coaches, I could reach out to them and see if they'd be willing for me to share their resources with you. Thank you, Tristan. And if uh, I can share this with you once I find out from them. Um, and Tony is adding to the comments and say also adding to Teddy's suggestion association for the advancement of deaf part of hearing. AADHH offers youth and young adult uh, work training and summer programs, as well as someone as some as well as some one on one ASL classes for hearing individuals and deaf. Uh, she uh, provided the website, adhh.org. Chelsea then says, I'll help out with that. Uh, life coach, agreed, we all need one, LOL. Marguerite, again, says lip reading. Uh, I'm sorry, I think it's Nancy says, do you have, okay, we've already, uh, yeah. we about the workshop question. Okay, um, it looks like that's it. But Teddy and Tamika, both of you got uh, thank you for this presentation a bit earlier. Yes, yes. So I just wanted to uh, add, we'll ask one more question. I know we have about nine minutes here. So uh, my last question to you, because uh, I know we talk about barriers, and, you know, talk about companies and just a lot of these that, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, uh, you know, individuals uh, experience. So my question is, uh, can you share any success stories where companies have effectively broken down barriers and empowered deaf and hard of hearing employees to excel? So let's, you know, if you have some good examples of companies. Well, um, I've kind of identified a few companies who have already used their services and uh, productions. Like, for example, one is Google, Amazon, um, you know, lots of different companies, typically big companies, Starbucks as well. You know, they, you see Starbucks, they have actually a sign language store in Washington, D.C., near Gallaudet. And they have actually deaf, hard of hearing and deafblind staff that work at that store. And there's a lot of products um, 
with uh, deaf artwork that they support. They've supported in the in the deaf community, uh, people who own businesses, creators in their companies, and they provide a lot of really great resources and opportunities to people uh, that I do only know of the one Starbucks store there, but that is a really good demonstration of how we can actually serve our deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community. And I do see uh, Marguerite in the comments in the chat said, um, Microsoft is also trying. Um, there's a bunch of different other companies too that I would mention, uh, Facebook and several others um, who are in the process of that. But the fact is that they they hire deaf, hard of hearing people in the company and they're listening to what they need um, to making sure that they provide opportunities to those people. And that shows them that we can actually do the work that, that they hire us for. And that's that. We, we can do it. Yes. Uh, I do also want to share that um, from my experience, um, as a small business owner, I do have a lot of challenges that I face as well in terms of getting access to financial resources, access to resources in general, access to different opportunities. And that's where deaf and hard of hearing people really are still facing barriers in our in our self-employment. And I just want to share too that one thing I'm doing is trying to include that in my work is including small businesses, including small business owners and advocates. ABOA, it's a Small Business Owners Association. Um, and now there's uh, there's a few in town in Detroit, actually, and I'm I'm one, a fellow, so I'm focusing on advocating and providing different opportunities for our deaf and hard of hearing disabled uh, community small of small business owners because there are opportunities in the in the city for people to be able to advance in their career and advance their they're in their field and i'm looking forward to working with um with many of them uh in my cohort figuring out how to plan and better better prepare for providing better opportunities for our deaf hard of hearing and deaf blind community so that's that's one thing that i'm involved with with that organization and i'm working to advocate as a small business owner of my own business, but also still being inclusive of and in, uh, involved with the other business owners in the area so that we can kind of further advance our deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind community. Yes, thank you uh, for mentioning. What is the name of the organization you work with your fellow? What's the name of that program again? So the city of Detroit Small Business Owners Advocacy SBOA, and that is uh, the fellowship opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I definitely uh, appreciate you, Teddy, for uh, you know speaking with me today and sharing all all of your wisdom and knowledge. I hope all of you. Um, have learned uh, some new things and you know um, and new resources to help you uh, you know in your journey um, in in uh, employment journey and so we're going to end it with uh, police to share some more uh, programs that we do here at uh, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition and uh, we also have our our evaluation form. Um, in the chat, so please uh, fill that out before you leave. Uh, give it to Belize. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Teddy, for joining us. Uh, thank you to our interpreters and our cart captioning. Um, other programs that we have here are MDRC, our hourly leadership engagement and advocacy development program, which caters to BIPOC parents and BIPOC adults. Um, the BIPOC Parents of Children with IDD. Um, we also have our Michigan Assistive Technology Program, which increases access to and knowledge of assistive technology for the entire <laughs> state of Michigan. 
We also have our Leaders for Inclusion program or LFI, which provides young adults with the information, tools, and skills they need to develop leadership and advocacy. Uh, they also provide training to organizations and nonprofits. Again, as Tamika said, please, if you haven't done so already, we would appreciate if you would fill out our evaluation. Um, on this page is also our MDRC um, lead-in uh, information as well as general MDRC information. Um, and if you would like to contact either of us today, you can reach out to Tamika at Tamika at mymdrc.org or myself, Felice, at mymdrc.org. Um, I know that Teddy said that he will be providing his information um, and we will send out an email to all of you as well with that information um, along with the recording Oops. of this event. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. We are, are so appreciative of your time today. Again, thank you, Teddy. Thank you, interpreters, Kristen and Kevin. Thank you, Clark. Uh, and that, excuse me, our CART functional. Thank you, Tamika. And that is it. I uh, thank you all for bringing The recording has stopped.